Good morning, everyone. My name is Doug Poland, and I'm an attorney at the law firm of Raf G. Woodward and chair of the Downtown Madison, Inc. Board of Directors. Thank you for joining us at the 2019 State of the Downtown. As we start this morning's program, out of respect for our speakers and the other attendees around you, I ask that you please silence your mobile devices. To begin, I would like to take this opportunity to thank and recognize the many businesses and organizations that help make this program possible by participating as sponsors in our state of the downtown. These sponsors are listed on the screens in front of you and on the back cover of the report placed at each of your seats. Please take a moment to acknowledge all of our sponsors and join me in a round of applause for their involvement and support of DMI and Downtown Madison. The presenting sponsor of the State of the Downtown is the law firm of Michael Best and Friedrich. We greatly appreciate Michael Best for their support of today's program and would like to welcome Katie Hinkle, Associate Attorney at Michael Best and member of the Downtown Madison Inc. Board of Directors to briefly say a few words. Katie. Thanks, Doug. Um, as Doug said, my name is Katie Hinkle, and I'm a proud member of the Board of Directors of DMI, and I'm an attorney practicing in the area of commercial real estate at Michael Best and Friedrich here in Madison. Michael Best is so pleased to be a sponsor at this wonderful event. And with 13 offices and 265 attorneys nationwide, we are involved in supporting communities we serve throughout the country through sponsorships like this, volunteerism, and pro bono hours. For example, we were just working with Second Harvest this summer, uh, packaging frozen pizzas, and my fingers have just now unfrozen from doing that. Um, but despite our nationwide impact, Madison has a special place in the firm's heart and in mine. I've lived and worked in cities all over the country, but I know that Madison is my forever home because of its energy, its diversity, and its commitment to thoughtful growth. As Madison grows and thrives, so do the businesses that are started here, and we all benefit from a city on the cutting edge. I, along with Michael Best, am so committed to driving Madison forward through thoughtful growth, new ideas, and collaborating with each and every one of you in this room who love and support Madison so much. We are excited to welcome new leadership and ideas to the city, and Michael Best is proud to continue supporting DMI as a cornerstone of the Madison community. Thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. And thanks again to Michael Best and Friedrich for its longtime support of in partnership with DMI and our State of the Downtown initiative. The State of the Downtown started in 2010 as an effort to create an annual benchmarking report to provide timely, objective, and accurate data about downtown Madison. The information gathered in the report is used to help determine priorities and action steps to sustain and grow a healthy and vital downtown. These priorities are outlined in DMI's civic agenda, which is updated annually and guides DMI's advocacy work. In producing this year's report, the ninth edition, the DMI staff worked with a number of partners, sources, and city staff to compile updated data and figures. The report that you have before you this morning was designed by DMI member Nelson Schmidt, and we're very grateful for their incredibly impressive work. In addition to releasing our State of the Downtown report this morning, we are excited to have convened a deeply experienced and knowledgeable panel of city experts to talk about some of the major challenges and opportunities facing our downtown today and in the years ahead. But before we begin our panel discussion, we are delighted and honored to welcome City of Madison Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway. Whether during the past five months in the, in the Mayor's office as Managing Director of the Mayor's Innovation Project at UW-Madison's Center on Wisconsin Strategy or serving three terms on the Madison Common Council, for many years, Mayor Rhodes Conway has been working tirelessly to make Madison a better city for all of its residents. 
We are so grateful to have her with us this morning to provide some opening remarks on major issues and opportunities impacting our downtown and to highlight some of her priorities for the city of Madison. At this time, please join me in welcoming Mayor Satya Rhodes Conway. Good morning, everyone. I have a, a small confession to make. I am not a morning person. <laughs> so I want to uh, thank Jason and DMI, not just for inviting me here, but also for delivering a strong cup of hot tea into my hand <laughs> so that I had some caffeine to get me going. Uh, and I wanna welcome all of you to our beautiful Overture Center and thank Sandra for hosting us this morning. Um, this is, it's really lovely to see not just the performances that happen in the theaters, but all of the community events that are able to happen uh, in Overture, and, and appreciate your leadership on that, Sandra. Um, it, I moved to Madison almost 20 years ago, and it really was walking probably right on this block down State Street when I realized that I was not ever leaving. I thought I had come for three months. I thought I was gonna go back to Southern California, um, but it was a beautiful fall day and I had just come from the farmer's market and I got a phone call from a friend um, that I sang with in a choir out in Long Beach. And, and I was telling her, oh my God, this is amazing farmer's market and it's a beautiful day and there's a football game and there's this great street with all these little stores. And she's like, you're not coming back, are you? <laughs> and I thought, mm, no, no, I'm not. I'm staying here because Madison is special and because downtown Madison is special. But I don't need to tell you that. You're all here because you know that. Um, and it's special because of so many things. It's special because of our geographic advantages, our beautiful natural environment, our schools, our economy, our nightlife, but mostly because of the people who make all those things happen. Um, and many of you are those people dedicated to not just downtown, but Madison as a city. Um, and I appreciate all the work that everybody is doing to make Madison a city that is better every day for everyone. We at the city are very appreciative and grateful for our collaborative relationships with partners like DMI. Um, and it really is a privilege to be a part of that and to be your mayor. Uh, before I start talking about my agenda, I want to share my congratulations on the recent renewal of the bid and the fact that 70% of the property owners participated in the renewal vote and more than 80% voted in favor of maintaining the bid, I think is a testament to a great, the great work that that organization is doing. So congratulations to those of you who are bid members. Um, and I'm excited to strengthen the relationship between DMI, the bid, and I see Tiffany in the back, um, and the city. I, I look forward to building those partnerships and working together. I imagine, I was thinking this morning, um, last year this time I was sitting right back there <laughs> um, and listening to the panel that you had last year and, um, and somebody said this morning, it's amazing how much can change in a year. And I said, yeah, now I have to make the speeches. <laughs> um, but one of the things that uh, I think during the course of that year has become clearer for me and I hope that I have articulated is the strong priorities that, that I have for this city. Affordable housing, rapid transit, dealing with climate change, and addressing the deep racial disparities that our community faces. Each of these things is a pivotal issue, not just for our city as a whole, but for downtown in particular. Each of these things, depending on what we choose to do, 
means that we head in a positive direction or that we miss an opportunity. And that's why I picked that list because I have seen cities across the country miss opportunities around each of these things and miss the moment to invest or to take them seriously or to tackle the problem and the challenge. Um, just one example, Austin, Texas failed to invest in transit when they had a chance to. And now their traffic congestion is hurting their economy. So we have a moment here. You, I mean, housing's easy, right? Everybody knows the housing examples. You can look across the country at growing cities and understand how housing markets hurt places like San Francisco and Seattle, but also smaller cities as well. And, and we have a moment here that we can get ahead of those problems. So that's why I picked that list. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about each of them, uh, how I'm thinking about it, and how I hope that you will join me in thinking about it. I would start with housing, uh, because it is the thing that I hear everywhere I go, whether I'm talking to individual folks who are challenged in their own housing situation, or whether I talk to employers who are starting to feel like they can't recruit the talent that they need because that talent can't find a place to live. So this is a challenge for our economy, it's a challenge for our community, and we need to take it on. Uh, don't get me wrong, the growth that we're experiencing is great. Right? The, the population growth is a fantastic thing, but we need to keep up with our housing production. Uh, we have uh, approximately right now a 2.8% rental vacancy rate and between 2005 and 2014 I think nine out of ten people who moved to Madison were renters. So those numbers don't look good together uh, and we need to be addressing that to get the rental vacancy rate back up. Um, somewhere around five percent is where I'd like it to be maybe a little higher um, and we have to do this because people who work in Madison and people who work in downtown Madison have to be able to live here, right? And I'm not talking about us, I'm talking about, I mean, you too, right? I want you to live downtown. Um, but I'm talking about baristas, I'm talking about nurses, I'm talking about firefighters and teachers and bus drivers. Everybody needs to be able to afford to live in the city of Madison. And so we are working hard at the city to grow and diversify our housing stock to address this. My capital budget will invest $5 million in affordable housing and another $1 million in land banking, which can be used towards affordable housing and other neighborhood supportive uses. That's not enough. It's what the city can do, but it's not enough. And so I call on all of you to think about how you can support the creation of housing and particularly affordable housing in our community. Whether that's just speaking up and saying yes, it's appropriate to have increased density here. Or yes, it's appropriate to have an affordable housing project here. Or whether that's thinking about how you as an employer or your firm or, your, or whatever uh, organization you belong to can work on employer assisted housing or how you can think about other ways to help us finance and create affordable housing in our community. And I'm very grateful to the work that is already going on in the private sector to do this, but we need more. Everybody needs to do more if we're gonna be a successful city. And that's a theme, right? We can do better, we can all do better. And I will challenge you, not just today, but every day from here on, to help us all do better. One place that we really, really need to do better is in addressing the issues of, of race and equity. It's easy to walk into these spaces and say what a wonderful city we have and how grateful we are for all of the amenities that we can access. And it's easy to forget that our city is not always wonderful for everyone. But we can't forget that. We have to remember I hope you all have seen the data. I hope you have heard stories from friends or family 
or young people or colleagues or neighbors about how challenging it can be for people of color to succeed in our community. To me, that's unacceptable. We have to be paying attention to this and we have to be paying attention to it every day. As we think about the current state of downtown and we look forward into the future of downtown, one of our priorities has got to be to make it more inclusive and welcoming to everyone. We know that communities of color face disproportionate challenges in meeting their basic needs. From housing to employment to health care, we have to build relationships to shift these outcomes to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to thrive. We're working at the city on our own internal city processes and our own capacity to move the needle on these issues. And as part of our strategy to support businesses in downtown Madison, I am emphasizing the need to achieve greater diversity in the downtown area. Who comes downtown, who shops downtown, who works downtown, and who owns downtown. If we work to create a city economy that works for more people, one of the efforts to support this growth is the city's relatively new business assistance team. And I want to acknowledge the city staff that are here. There's a number of folks from our economic development department. Um, actually, city staff, would you just raise your hands or stand up and wave? I know you're here. Thank you all for joining us. <laughs> we have a wonderful staff. Um, and I know that many of you interact with them on a regular basis. Uh, anyway, the business assistance team um, is focused on making sure that both existing and potential or new businesses can navigate the municipal process um, and regulatory requirements and get connected to resources um, that help businesses succeed. Long term, it would be my goal to not need that navigational assistance because we have done a good enough job on our systems that they make sense to everyone. But short term, if folks need help, they're going to get it. And the Office of Business Resources is working hard, um, even as that team gets started, to make sure that we're paying attention to the issues that face small and local businesses. We're also working on uh, expanding the concept of the Market Ready program so that entrepreneurs, particularly women and people of color, who want to start a business can get the support that they need to start a business and hopefully to start to locate downtown in some of our empty storefronts. We're also pushing to support ownership in a number of ways. I think it's really important for us to help small businesses that are successful move towards owning their storefronts or their properties so that they can be more stable and successful in the long term. And the city is working on programs to support that. We are in the final throes of the budget process. I will be announcing my budget on the first. Um, and in that process, we have prioritized sustainability, truth in budgeting, fiscal responsibility, and most importantly, equity in the process of building the budget. The budget is a critical way to advance my priorities, and I hope that you will notice the various pieces of it that do support equity and that support the continued success of downtown and the city. One of the major investments that we're making in the budget is on rapid transit. I hope that you all had a chance to pick up and take a look at our sheet on Metro Forward. And if you haven't, please get one on your way out. Madison's unique geography, uh, which is most noticeable downtown, is one of our greatest assets. However, the fact that our thriving downtown is squeezed between two lakes makes transportation challenging sometimes. We can't accommodate the growth that we expect if everybody drives a car. We just literally don't have enough lanes on our streets. We'd have to widen East Washington by two, maybe four lanes. We'd have to widen Park Street. We'd have to widen Universe. Can you imagine? I mean, I just, you, like, what would you do? Where would you get the land? <laughs> it's, it's just not possible. We can't build a superhighway through the isthmus. 
And those, for those of you who have long memories, you'll remember that they tried that once upon a time, and it was roundly rejected. So we rejected it then, we reject it now, we need a different solution. So for downtown to continue to be successful, we have to invest in a modern, efficient transit system. For this reason, as well as to support our city's values of providing equitable access to downtown, support a thriving economy, and to shrink our own carbon footprint, I'm implementing Metro Forward and Bus Rapid Transit. So you may have heard a little bit about Metro Forward, and again, I refer you to the lovely fact sheets, and I, thanks to the staff who worked so hard, including Tom, who's here, um, to make that possible. Uh, but Metro Forward is a, a multifaceted transit investment that will position us for the fastest possible implementation of bus rapid transit that will speed up people's commutes by up to 25% through expanded and more frequent service about every 15 minutes, the use of dedicated lanes, signal priority, and ticket purchases on the platform rather than uh, at the door. So those of you who ride the bus like I do, no more card, not valid. Card, not valid, right? And then you're there for five minutes. So we're trying to speed every piece of the metro experience up so that it is a more viable option for folks to commute through our city. I'm actually particularly excited about the fact that it will go later into the evening so that when Amy and I have our season tickets to Forward Theater, we can take the bus. <laughs> and then we can take the bus home, <laughs> which is the best part. Um, and of course, for the folks that work late downtown, I think that'll be a real advantage. And I, I hope that it will actually help on parking as well because the fewer people that are driving their own cars down here, the easier it will be for those that do. Um, so I'm, I am really excited about Metro Forward um, and how many people we're going to be able to serve with this system. Uh, and I know that there are still some questions about where we will route both the bus rapid transit and Metro buses in general downtown. Um, we are actively listening to all of you about that. And if you have thoughts on it, um, Tom Lynch, <coughs> transportation director, is right over here. <laughs> no, seriously, you can talk to any of us about it, and Metro has a great website um, that accepts comments as well. Um, but it is critical, obviously, that our transit system serve downtown, um, and it is critical that it be accessible to everyone. So that is a major investment um, in our budget and in the capital budget, and you'll see that reflected in the operating budget as well. Next, I want to talk a little bit about climate uh, because I think that it's not, um, we have to talk about it everywhere. Right? I hope that you all paid attention to the climate strike and to the amazing leadership of young people on this issue. Um, I'm inspired by it, but being inspired is not enough. We have to take action. We know that climate change is happening. We know that it's happening now. We saw the impacts last year in the flooding, but we see it every day in our temperature swings and our increasingly violent storms. Um, and we will continue to feel it um, throughout the winter. Our winter pattern is changing. It doesn't get as cold, it doesn't freeze as hard. Pests live through the winter now. So there is a cascade of impacts of climate change that have implications for our community. And we have to work proactively both to reduce the emissions that cause climate change, but also to be prepared for the impacts of climate change, whatever they may be. So we're working hard uh, with UW-Madison to enter into a partnership to assess those impacts and city services and our infrastructure and how we need to be prepared for climate change, but we're also working hard to reduce our emissions profile at the city. We've committed to get to 100% renewable energy by 2030, I am hopeful that by next year we will be halfway there. Um, and that is through a combined investment in solar energy and energy efficiency uh, and renewable energy credits uh, with our partner MG&E. But that's only halfway there, so we have a lot more to do. And that's only city operations, so we have a lot more to do. We need the private sector to join us in making that kind of commitment 
to reduce emissions. We need everyone to commit to being as energy efficient as possible and to switching over to 100% renewable energy as soon as possible. And so I challenge all of you, both in your personal lives and in your professional lives, to do just that. We have worked, you may have heard uh, that the county executive and I get along these days. <laughs> so I'm excited to share that we are working with Dane County to create a climate change collaborative and we recently convened leadership from across 23 municipalities to address issues of climate change and to figure out ways that we can work together um, to meet what I see as the critical challenge of our time. We have a lot to do. We're working hard, but we're just getting started. And so again, I ask you to join us in that work. Finally, I wanna turn back to downtown. Downtown is the heart of Madison. The cultural opportunities, the shopping, the experiences, downtown is part of why people love Madison. Again, it's why I fell in love with Madison, and I think that I am not alone in that. And so it is absolutely critical for us collectively to make sure that downtown stays strong and safe and thriving, that the heart keeps beating, and that it is a place where everyone can come and fall in love with Madison. Downtown deserves and will get from my administration special attention because of how important it is to everyone in this city. And again, I challenge you to think how we all can make downtown a better place for everyone. I wanna thank DMI for the role that you play in making downtown a better place for everyone and that the work you will continue to do to make that true. And I wanna thank you all again for the invitation to join you this morning and for the ongoing partnership in making not just downtown but Madison as a city a better place to live. Our shared goals require collaboration and mutual support, and I look forward, and I know my entire administration looks forward to working together to strengthen downtown and the city. I'm really looking forward to the distinguished panel that is coming up here, um, all folks that I've had a chance to speak with uh, at one time or another, but always folks that I learn something from. So I'm eager to hear your thoughts um, and frankly, to hear all of your thoughts. One of the things that's most important to me is to be engaged with everyone and to listen to everyone's voices. And so I invite you, lastly, to reach out when you have a question or a thought or an idea. Don't be strangers, we're not hard to find. Thank you again for everything you're doing and for the invitation to be here today. Thank you, Mayor Rhodes Conway, for all you are doing for our city and for downtown Madison. We greatly appreciate your leadership and support on so many issues and projects important to DMI. And we share your priorities for economic development, housing, transit, and sustainability for our city. We thank you for your partnership and for the excellent relationship between uh, your office and Downtown Madison, Inc. And as always, if there is ever anything DMI can do to help support you or the city's outstanding staff, please don't be shy about asking us. To continue the conversation on many of the issues and opportunities raised by the mayor, please join me in welcoming DMI President Jason Nilstrup who will introduce our panel this morning and will moderate their discussion. Jason.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Jason Elstrup, and I have the great fortune of being the president of Downtown Madison, Inc. We are so excited you guys are here today. This is an enormous crowd. We have over 300 people here that care about downtown, want to do exactly what the mayor said, make it a downtown for everyone. Mayor, thank you for your presentation and your speech. It resonated very deeply with me, and know that I and everyone at DMI are behind you to make sure we help make downtown better for everyone. So thank you. I also particularly want to say thank you to a few other elected officials that are in the room. It takes a team, uh, and we have a wonderful team here in our city council. Alders Mike Verveer, Alders Patrick Heck, and Alder Paul Skidmore are all here. So please stand, and we'd love to give you a round of applause. Now, this is one of my favorite things to do all year. I was like a kid at Christmas this morning, thinking how lucky I am to be engaging and having a discussion with four important leaders in our city. These are four people that are making a difference in the areas that the mayor just talked about. It's like we almost had your speech beforehand. We brought people that are actually making a difference in this city. Uh, this group is going to help us dive deeper into the issues that the mayor discussed and dive deeper into the four areas that DMI works on in advocacy every day. Quality of life, transportation, economic development, and diversity and inclusion. So we are very lucky to have this esteemed panel. First and foremost, my mentor and friend, longtime colleague in hospitality. I think last year I came up with the term hospitalitarian, which I, I literally did bring the tea to the mayor. I, sh I now know that she likes strong black tea with uh, two sugars or one sugar. At least two. <laughs> Things you should know. Um, now everyone does know. So does City Channel. But back to my friend and mentor, Deb Archer. She is a leader and a visionary in this city that we have not seen in a long time. What she has done to raise the specter of tourism in downtown, in our city, and throughout our metro area is, is incredible. People don't understand that tourism is a 1.3 billion, with the B, dollar industry in Dane County. And that is thanks to the amazing work that Deb Archer does as president and CEO of Destination Madison. Under her leadership, they were named the Wisconsin's most helpful CVB. The Madison Area Sports Commission was named the National Sports Commission of the Year. These are huge accomplishments. She's helped bring seminal events like Ironman, CrossFit, and who could forget last summer, Bucky's on Parade. There's still quite a few. How many are around still? A lot. We'll just answer. You don't have a mic on you, so I don't know why I'm asking you questions. <laughs> She's also brought conventions like the U.S. Conference of Mayors, the World Stem Cell Summit, and the Con uh, Congress of New Urbanism. Prior to serving in Madison, she had senior leadership roles in the Kansas City CVB and Park City, Utah CVB and Chamber of Commerce. Please, let's welcome my mentor, Deb Archer. Now, Tom Lynch. Hi, Tom. You were just called out by the mayor. All feedback on downtown riding will go through you. <laughs> Not controversial at all. Tom Lynch, the first time he ever spoke publicly as in his position was last year on the same stage. So we're very fortunate. But to watch what you've done over the last year to grow transportation. We were Metro Transit was just named one of the top Metro Transit, Transit organizations in America. Tom Lynch is leading by example. And he's leading by example because he literally has 30 titles here. He's in a professional engineer, a traffic engineer, a transportation planner, and a certified planner. So he is the guy that can get the job done. He has over 25 years of experience working in planning and transportation. Currently serves as a director of transportation for the city of Madison, which leads Metro Transit, traffic engineering, and the parking utility, which has over an $80 million a year budget. Do you get the money from the tickets uh, that when I park? No. Oh, maybe that's a sore subject. I'm sorry I brought it up, but I gave you an extra $25 just yesterday. Uh, yes, and I'm a guy that like literally never drives, and somehow when I do drive, anyway, I biked this morning. Thank you, the rain is holding off. Uh, but he is dedicated to meeting our transportation needs through different ways than single occupancy vehicles. Uh, 
Tom has been a real partner to DMI, and we can't wait to continue our relationship with him. So everyone, please welcome Tom Lynch. Ah, yes. Ann Morrison and I matched outfits today. Yes, we look very good. Ann Morrison, if you don't know Ann Morrison, I hope that this is a coming out party for Ann Morrison because she is one of these amazing, quiet leaders around town. And her dad is like literally looking right at me. Okay, uh, she is someone that has a passion for our city and is one of the most prominent people in downtown. She is on the DMI board of directors on the executive committee. So yes, she's my boss, so I should carefully watch my words. But she has a passion for the built environment and building and fostering strong communities. Anne is a shareholder at Urban Land Interest and a partner and principal at New Year Investments. She's worked in housing policy both in Minnesota and Illinois and has helped shepherd land approval processes in the city of New York, supported business development, marketing, architecture, and engineering firms. She's also worked for two public financing authorities uh, in both Wisconsin and this, in New York City. And she currently, as I said, serves on our board of directors, but also is on the board at Madison Development Corporation, MDC, and is a member of the city's housing strategy committee. My friend, Ann Morrison. Last, but certainly not least, is Angela Russell. Angela and I became friends about a year. Are we friends? <laughs> oh, I was just trying to zing it in there that we could become friends. We met each other a year ago, and she instantly knew that she could make fun of me whenever she wanted, which I love. So I'm hoping she's got some good zingers in today. But Angela Russell is also one of the most important leaders in this city, not just when it comes to diversity, inclusion, and equity, but overall. She is currently the Vice President of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and the Vice President of the CUNA Mutual Foundation at the CUNA Mutual Group. She is responsible for leading the development, direction, and implementation of short and long-term strategies to support the diversity, inclusion, and oversees CUNA's Mutual's Corporate Social Responsibility Program. That's a mouthful. You have a lot to do. So thank you for taking a few minutes today. Now, most importantly, in two th well, you wait for it, wait for it. In 2018, this is huge, Angela. You should be so proud of this. I'm building it, aren't I? 2018, Angela was named one of the most powerful diversity officers by Black Enterprise Magazine. We are so lucky to have her in our community. Prior to being at CUNA Mutual, she worked various jobs in public health and various roles in Wisconsin state government. She currently serves on the Madison Urban Ministry and Community Shares of Wisconsin Board. This is going to be fun. Angela was, is going to get the last word today, so we're very excited for what she has to say. Angela Russell, everybody. All right, let's have some fun. I've changed up the questions that I already gave you in advance, so everything's new. Just, just kidding. All right, and we're gonna start with economic development. We're going to hit up the key themes that the mayor talked about. Uh, and we're gonna start with economic development. What economic development opportunities and challenges do you see for downtown Madison? And as a corollary, what actions or policies need to happen to ensure downtown is where all people and businesses can prosper? I love Jason's like a kid at Christmas this morning. I feel like I've never seen Jason where he's not a kid at Christmas. He's on <laughs> all the time. And um, thank you for bringing your energy. Right, that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. You can ask my wife. Yes, that's true. So uh, you asked an economic development question, but you asked it of a real estate nerd. So I'm going to kind of give you a real estate answer and say that, you know, the challenges and the opportunities um, availability of high quality affordable housing, affordable at a variety of income levels, availability of office space, these are essential for our economic development and right now uh, they are the barriers I think to our economic development as well. Um, we're short on space. I think that's pretty clear in the report that you're seeing today. Uh, we're also have historically I think been a little short on flexibility, on cooperation, um, on open-mindedness, and it's kind of prevented us from seeing uh, the forest through the trees. I, I think a lot of us um, wish that 
our city could save some of its moral outrage over uh, sandwich boards and over maybe athletic fields, and I'm not trying to get in a fight with anyone. But I do think <laughs> just, we just have some really right big goals that we want to address, and I'm, I, you know, I think with better communication, um, with clearer policies, with um, you know, some streamlined efforts, I think we can do a lot of that, and it's super exciting to hear uh, the mayor talk about that this morning, um, not to put her on the spot on any of those hot button issues, which I don't want to spend time thinking about, yeah. honestly. I want to think about the big things. Um, overall, things look pretty great in Madison. It's named, you know, this year one of the top places for te tech talent. It's a great place to live, bikeable, livable, great place to raise children. And as the mayor pointed out, um, we can be on the best of list, but that doesn't mean everyone's living their best life in Madison. And as we don't make sure that the economic prosperity is felt um, everywhere, we're going to see those disparities chip away at uh, the quality of life that we all enjoy and that's going to make it harder for us to be on the good lists and easier for us to be on the bad lists. So, um, you know, we're going to start to see things like continued homelessness. We're seeing it in our schools. Um, we're seeing it in other places and we don't want to be on those wrong lists. So there are some bright spots in this report, but I think that there are also some canaries in the coal mine. If you turn to page four, you'll see that development in downtown Madison, investment in downtown Madison has really kind of fallen off precipitously. And so when you look at 2018 and 2019, you have to think, what does this mean for 2021 and 2022? And are we thinking forward? And are we prepared for kind of more housing shortages and more office um, space needs? Um, on the commercial side, uh, the mayor talked about the affordable housing crisis, and I'll hope to talk about that later. Um, but on the commercial side, we also have a very low vacancy rate. Um, and that means when new users want to come to downtown, we, we don't have a place to put them. Um, at ULI, we love to talk about Zendesk. We love to talk about how they grew from four people in the basement of Center 7 to taking up 27,000 square feet in Madison and how they're one of downtown's biggest employers right now, and that is super awesome. Uh, but if a Zendesk were to come to us today, we don't have a place to put them and we don't have a fast answer for how to get them in there. And I just was talking with some of the city staff about the same thing. We don't have a lot of landing pads in Madison. And so we need to have the foresight to start to think about where those landing pads are gonna be and to work cooperatively um, to make sure that uh, we can make them happen in a timely manner to attract um, those business and job opportunities. Um, so what I'm also hearing as I talk to people about economic development challenges and opportunities, I would say talent, talent, talent. I think um, how many of you guys are hiring right now in your companies? I would, I'm hearing almost every level, whether it's uh, dishwashers, whether it's associates and legal firms, that our people are having trouble attracting and retaining that talent. And um, it does go to the housing crisis, is where are we gonna put them? Where are they gonna live? So we need to solve some of our space needs, I think both on the housing side and on the commercial real estate side to allow downtown to grow. This pipeline looks bleak. Um, but I think with more cooperation, um, we can look at this data that we have and really start to get comfort with one another, stakeholders, neighborhoods, developers, city staff, to try to get kind of shovel, I hate the word shovel ready, but try to get some, some place, try to identify and try to, you know, focus our resources on places where this kind of development can actually happen. Awesome. I think it's important to, to, to understand what you just said, that there are some weaknesses, right? There's some, some areas where we have grow, we, we need to grow and create some challenges. And one of those challenges is in transportation. And Tom, the question is for you. What are the strengths and weaknesses of our current transportation system? And where is the investment most needed to address those challenges on the demands on our community? Thanks. Um, I'll start with the, the strengths. We have a culture that really supports multimodal transportation. If you think about it, for two to three decades, we've been investing in, in bicycle paths, facilities. That's led, led us to, is that better? Very perfect, thank all you. All right, all right. I was just, <laughs> I wanted my hands free. But I'm not gonna have my hands free. Uh, so that's led us to platinum. Uh, you know, back in the 1970s, we purchased the bus system and the city council and the mayors have been investing in the, in the city council. So those are our strengths, but what are some, another strength is people actually want to be here. So I was just in Cleveland and I passed through Detroit. Since 1960, those cities have lost two thirds of their population. 
Okay. If we look at uh, Milwaukee and Chicago, since 1960, both of those cities have left, lost about a quarter of their population. Right? Minneapolis right now is about even with their population as where they were in 1960, and that's due to a resurgence that's occurred in the last decade or so. Well, Madison is double the population that we were in 1960, double. Okay? So you think about what have been the substantive transportation improvements that have occurred in the Madison area since 1960. Okay. All I can think of is, is the Broadway Beltline. I don't know if there's really any other substantive. And yet we've doubled our population. You know, you look down, you know, you look down East Washington Avenue and we've, we've uh, amassed 14,000 new dwelling units in the last five years. 14,000. 3.2 million square feet of office space and, and manufacturing and institutional in the last three years. And we haven't done anything really for our transportation system. Nothing. Okay. So that leads us to our weaknesses, right? <laughs> our weaknesses. Um, if we go by projections, okay, Dane County is projected to get 85,000 more jobs in the next 30 years. Madison is going to capture 45,000 of those. The Isthmus, downtown right here, is going to capture 10,000 of those jobs. Okay. That's going to create 800,000 new trips per day. 800,000 new trips per day. So let's put that in perspective. Okay. East Washington carries 50,000 trips per day. That's eight East Washington avenues. Okay. Eight. With East Washington Avenues. So are we going to solve this problem by adding some more lanes? You know, we just can't. We have to really graduate from being a big little city to a little big city and address um, these transportation challenges head on. So what's the greatest need? Well, after the mayor just said rapid transit, do you think I should say something different? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> What did I say? More cars? No. Uh, uh. <laughs> um. Oh, maybe not. That's right. um, we need a modern system that moves people, and not just two people in a car, you know, 80 people in a bus. That's what we need. And we need more buses. And we need it reliable so that you know that if you go down at 2.30 in the afternoon, when you come home at 8.30 at night, you're not going to be at the bus stop for an hour or 45 minutes waiting for the next bus home. We need something that's accessible and reliable, and you can count on it. And so um, kind of the challenge is, is, you know, we've had these challenges, and they've been growing. And so we could either choose to make the sacrifices and build the system that we need for the next two to three decades now, or we could wait another 10 years. You know? And so, I don't know, what do we do? Well, one thing I know we can do, and something the mayor has been really pushing, is make sure we push transit. And if you are an employer, and I'm lucky enough to work for an employer, subsidize your transit use. And I use it every single day, and that makes a difference. If we want a better transportation system, we need to use a better transportation. We need to, that doesn't make any sense, but you know what I mean. Yes. Yes, ride sure. the bus is Let's what I'm trying cards. to Everyone say. Everyone show your card, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, Deb, what are the advantages and weaknesses of downtown when you're selling Madison as an event and convention destination? And what changes and enhancements do we need to do to remain competitive? Well, I think everybody sitting in this room knows exactly what, why this is a great place for us to have the honor to promote. Um, between um, the fabulous restaurants, uh, you know, the walkability, the compactness of our city, um, the cleanliness of our city, those are all things that we as humans like when we travel. And we have so much to offer in such an amazing, um, um, accessible um, area. And um, I know our team who paints word pictures for people all the time and tries to convey what a great place this is because a lot of our customers have never been here before and they don't even come here when we t book business because we have to do it remotely. Um, we have to paint the picture, but it's so easy to do when we're able to talk about places like the Overture Center. And if you think about a lot of cities you've been to, particularly when you're talking about events, the number of event spaces we have within a compact area is 
incredible. If you think you can walk from Monona Terrace and have an event, to come here to have an event, to go to the university and have an event, and you can all do it on foot with exception of a few weeks of the year or maybe months, um, it's, um, we are incredibly fortunate. And then you add in, you layer in the incredible food scene, a growing music scene, um, it's, um, it's, it's incredible. We have a, a wonderful, wonderful array of things to sell. I think where we start um, uh, in sort of experiencing pushback are things like um, when people do come here on site visits. You know, we, we, this is the first time in a long time we've had empty storefronts. You know, we've got a waning retail sector. We've got, um, those are some of the things that are starting to sort of bubble up that honestly for 20 years since I've done this, we haven't seen and we're starting to see those things. Sort of those cracks that you were talking about, Anna. You start to see those cracks coming through. Um, those are some of the things. And, but there are also things we can do. One of the things that we hope DMI can help us with with the city, we have to get that hotel built at Judge Doyle Square. That saga has got to come to fruition because for the long-term success of Monona Terrace, which has been an incredibly, incredibly successful and run building, but it's starting to see cracks in its business, mostly in banquet and wedding business because of all the outlying wedding barns and other event venues. For the long-term health of Monona Terrace, we have to have that hotel at Judge Doll Square. It will not, it will not be successful 10 years from now without that hotel, and that's really important. Um, I think some of the other things, you know, visitors are starting to see, to starting to not feel safe downtown. Um, we're starting to really, we're hearing that. We haven't heard that before. They're starting to hear that. You know, how do we work together um, to make sure people feel safe? Um, that's, that's really important. Um, and I think that um, some of the things we are working with you on are things like we're having a, a a new collaboration with arts and culture about if we all work together as arts and culture entities, what else could happen in this community that we can create that not just visitors will enjoy, but all of us enjoy. And I think the thing that, you know, and I, I, I love to say this as part of our work is visitors love the same things we love. And visitors make so many of the things possible that we love because we could never, the people who live here could never support the restaurants that are here and the other business, the attractions, Olbrick Gardens, they couldn't survive on just our population. Our visitors make those things happen. So working on things like an arts collaboration and growing our arts and culture scene together, I think is another really um, golden opportunity for us. Downtown is a great place, but it is not always a great place for everybody. Angela, what opportunities and challenges do you see regarding equity and inclusion currently in downtown Madison, and where do we begin to address some of these, you know, systematic issues that we have throughout our downtown? Yeah, before, is this still on? Yeah. Before I answer your question, can I just respond to one of the things that Deb said? Absolutely. Is that okay? Can I just yeah. do my own thing, Jason? Yeah. <laughs> That's what I do best. Yeah. <laughs> I, get it from, I get it from my daughter. <laughs> um, um, I learned it from her. So it's interesting, Deb, that you said that visitors love the same thing that we love, and what we love is generally based in white dominant culture. So I'm really curious about what is the visitor, what kind of visitors and um, what are we doing around tourism for folks of color? Because when we go out and work with historically black colleges and universities, number one, they're like Wisconsin, and I've never heard of Madison. So what's gonna draw us here? And we've had some success at CUNY Mutual in getting graduates from HBCUs here, but what's interesting is they wanna continue working at CUNY Mutual, but they don't wanna stay in Madison. So can we have some, can we go back to Texas and still work for CUNY Mutual? So there's some challenges. So to get back to your question, the challenges that I see are around representation and a sense of belonging. So if you look around this room, which is a room of downtown leaders, how much representation do you actually see? Now, visual diversity is just one aspect of diversity, but we don't have a lot of leaders of color in Madison in the downtown area. And I don't think it's because we don't, that we don't exist. I'm actually here, you know, some other folks are here. Um, it's actually, how are we actually creating that pipeline for folks to get invited to join the discussion? And I don't think, I think we do a terrible job of that. Um, so what I actively, so a, a, a representation and creating a sense of belonging. So if I was a new leader of color here in Madison and I came to this meeting, I would be like, oh, do I actually belong in this community? 
Um, so what I actively try to do on my own time is look for mm -hmm. signs, little subtle signs of that I belong here or that this is an inclusive place for me. And there are some institutions that do a better job and there are some that don't. What was the other part of your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, where do we begin to address these challenges? I yeah. mean, you're bringing up absolutely absolutely valid points that people need to be at the table, that we need to have different leaders and inclusive leaders. Yeah. So is that one way to begin to address these challenges? I, I think so. I think one of the way to address the challenges is, number one, uh, the mayor talked about this, is relationships. Going out and actively getting to know people different than you, not in a tokenistic way, but in a really authentic way. And I was, in, I was just in Austin yesterday giving a talk on diversity and inclusion in the credit union industry. And one of the things that I talked about, and I'm always shocked at what comes out of my mouth, but no one, no one else really is. I talked about the notion, Leslie, why are you laughing? <laughs> I, I talked about the notion of that leaders of color, you have to bring your white man with you because when I go out and talk, it's not gonna be heard as much, um, or it's gonna be heard differently if, I didn't, if I'm just doing it alone. So how do I have white allyship alongside of me speaking Similar, similar things, not speaking over, but speaking in conjunction with me. And mentoring people who are different than you. I have a key mentor and bo former boss, Tim Casper. Did you know I was gonna say that? Congratulations. <laughs> um, um, how do you seek out diverse talent? Tim has intentionally done that when he was working for the governor and was a key mentor to me and I would not be where I am today if it weren't for his leadership and mentorship. So um, developing authentic relationships, mentoring and listening. And I have to personally say thank you to, to you, Angela, because you've been a mentor to me in this space. You have pushed me and made me think about uncomfortable ideas and concepts, and that's how we make a difference. One of the things that you pointed out to me is that do I have a lot of conversations with people of a different uh, socioeconomic status than I do? And the fact of the matter is I, I, I don't. And I need to make sure that I'm driving and building relationships with people that are different than me in a myriad of ways. And so thank you for continuing to push us as DMI and me as a person. So I'm very appreciative Can of that. Can I just add on one other thing is really intentionally going in environments where you are the minority and practicing what that feels like. Because then you're going to be uncomfortable, but that's where the learning, learning happens. So there are a whole host of events that are hosted by communities of color in Madison. Learn about those and go and just be present. And. Now, we've got to have a little bit of a lightning round here because we only have a few minutes. So a, a couple minutes per would be oh, fantastic. Okay. Where do you anticipate the growth and development in downtown? How do you foresee it in, say, the Cap District area, Park Street, uh, Regent Street, which is an area close to taking off, and Monroe Street? And where do you see the growth happening downtown? Uh, I'll try to talk fast. Um, a few years ago, DMI went through a strat planning process and we talked about kind of where the boundaries of our downtown is. Does it go from here to here or where is it? And as someone who uh, spent most of her life in and around the Capitol Square, my first house was on Butler Street, um, my definition of downtown was pretty rigid and I wasn't very open to expanding it. I mean, this was downtown, this is where it is. Um, it, it, a lot of my DMI colleagues really forced me to reconsider that and to think more expansively. If we want to continue to be the center of gravity for the Madison economic region, we have got to let ourselves grow. And these are areas that you mentioned, Cap East, Regent Street, West Wash, these are the areas that we have to work with. And we need to recognize that opportunity and seize on that opportunity and not let that opportunity pass us by. Um, so I think they're critical for us uh, solving our, you know, trans meeting our transportation goals, our sustainability goals, our diversity goals, our affordable housing goals. And um, for you who work in real estate and those of you who, God bless you, serve on neighborhood associations, you know it's not always easy to work in these neighborhoods. Um, so do speak up when you see good uh, good projects come your way because, um, again, they're fewer and farther between right now and they need your support. Um, so when a project comes in, I guess, uh, in these areas, and I know I'm wearing my real estate developer hat, but we're not the most hated professions. Politicians apparently are more hated. <laughs> clergy and then real estate developers were actually okay. Um, clergy? <laughs> yeah, clergy. Yeah, we're better than clergy. Um, <laughs> so I, I know it, it sounds very self-interested, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> You learn something new every day, Angela. Um, it's not Sunday, but I'm feeling a little, yeah. 
But, um, you know, don't think of every opportunity that happens in these areas as a chance to take 20% of the density that should be allowed or seems to be allowed out. And uh, don't grind every proposal into two colors of brick and two colors of metal panels. And if we have committees that are producing five-story buildings with four-story setbacks and two colors of brick and two colors of metal panel that are 20% less of the housing than we could be doing, then we have to look at whether our process is doing this right, because these are our opportunities and they're here waiting for us to make cool stuff happen. Well, if, if, uh, <laughs> if Reverend Jonathan Greaser is here, my Reverend from Grace Episcopal Church, I do I really love you. Great. Yes, he's fantastic. <laughs> and I'll tell him that on Sunday. <laughs> okay, so Tom, bus rapid transit is a huge part of how we move forward. But to me, that's not a magic panacea to solve all of our problems. What does our system look like in the future in 10 and 20 years? How do we ensure we continue to move people properly beyond just this first bus rapid transit line? Yeah, I think in 10 years it would be nice if um, transit was the way you got around. You know, you chose because it was so much less hassle, so much easier. Yeah. How many of you rent a car when you go to Manhattan? You don't, because it's a liability. It would be nice if transit was so convenient that it just beats traveling by car hands down. Uh, for parking, I think we need parking because parking provides access to downtown. But it would be nice if that parking uh, reflected the true cost of it. You know, there's a hidden subsidy. Generally, um, like downtown, downtown underground spaces are rented for half of what they cost to build and service the debt. You know, if, if they actually, um, if a person driving a car actually experienced the true cost of that parking space, they might make a different choice, right? And then um, transportation in 20 years, it would be nice if it would be common for individuals and families to not feel like they have to own a car. You know, right now we're not there, right? You might take transit, but you still have a car in your garage because you need it. But in 20 years, if we actively pursue TDM, transportation demand management, you know, incentives to help people um, get out of the cars and look at other alternatives, it would be possible where, why do you own a car? It's so much easier just to have your bus pass. So. Well, and I think it's important to realize some people don't have the choice of owning a car. And that if with a robust transit system, we have a stronger economy for equity. And a strong transit system means you have better equity, you have better affordable housing, and you, you work with uh, areas like that we used to work in, and I used to work in, in hospitality. People work different hours, and right now the busing system doesn't. So that helps meet that. A robust transit system is more, equi more equal, and it helps with affordable housing, and helps with economic development. Yeah, you, you should be here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Good. Thank you. Yes, I, I yes. feel like that was really good. <laughs> Um, Deb, where do you see the future growth of tourism in our city, and how can, how can downtown Madison take advantage of that growth? I think um, we were just having a meeting yesterday. I think one of the things we want to start focusing on is winter. We really, um, there are a lot of opportunities. To, there are so many things to do in the winter, but it's different. We need to knit them together so people can understand they can come here in the winter and enjoy themselves. Um, and so that is really going to be a focus of ours. I think multi-generational travel. I think, I, I, I think that, and it's going back to some of the things you were talking about, Angela. I think there are some things we need to focus on, and we've talked about this, is we're also, between the safety and security things that people are talking about, people of color don't feel comfortable in a lot of settings. And so what role can we play in training and getting people to understand that we are a place for all, and we want everyone who comes here to know that we are happy they are here and have them have a really positive experience. So I think that transit, the workforce thing, and Anne, you brought this up earlier, I mean, anybody in the service sector here that is fully employed, I would be shocked. And um, that's also a, and a detractor for the hospitality industry if people don't have good service. If they're, not, if they're either uncomfortable or they're not being taken care of, what do we remember when we travel? It wasn't a great experience. And transportation is a huge part, and affordable housing is a huge part of making sure we can have a healthy workforce um, that people are not stranded. I mean, there are businesses opening here with half the number of people that they need to truly open. Um, and so um, we, we're trying to figure out what the role is that we as an organization can play in some of these things too. But we do, there are a lot of opportunities. I mentioned the arts and culture piece, the music scene, um, and I think the winter piece are things that we know we can grow. 
And you can see all of these four subjects are so inextricably in intertwined. And so it's important that we all have this panel together talking about them holistically. Now, but the last question does go to Angela Russell. What are some... <laughs> I guess you could say no and we just end. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> what are some positive equity and inclusion efforts happening right now in our city? And what do we, as a community, need to focus on now moving forward to ensure downtown is a place of opportunity for everybody? Well, those are such small questions, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> so I think there is a lot going, going well for us. I think that one of the things that I've seen over uh, the past 10 years increasingly is that the business sector is getting involved. For a long time, I thought that the focus on racial equity was just government and nonprofits, but now I see a lot more business getting engaged in terms of racial equity, diversity in general, and inclusion, so that's great. And I think another thing that we have going for us in Madison is that we have a desire to do well and a desire to do better. So that's, that's wonderful. So as I think about the things that we can do to move forward, I have two things that I, I just wanna mention especially for uh, downtown, is really thinking about inclusive design and how can we design our infrastructure that signals that we're welcoming, inclusive, and that there's a place to belong for everyone. I'm going to use an example from CUNA Mutual real quick. Um, and it's not related, it's not diversity in terms of racial diversity, it's around ability status. So a couple of years ago, we had an intern in a motorized wheelchair, and he wanted to show me something. I'm like, okay. So he showed me that he could get into our building just fine, but he could not get from our lobby into the main atrium because there is no push button accessibility um, in the front in the front or in the back. So he'd, he'd need to take an elevator down and come back up or vice versa. And so when I contacted facilities, this is before you got here, Bill, so don't worry. Um, they, they said, well, we did what was ADA compliant. And that put a, a light bulb on for me that compliance is not always inclusive. And so when we're talking about inclusive design, it means that we have people who are gonna be impacted at the design table to begin with. So if we're, we're thinking about creating an inclusive downtown, who's gonna be most impacted? Who do we want welcomed? And are they at the table right now? So that's number one. And then number two is how are we as each one of our individual organizations being intentional about integrating DEI into our overall strategy? Not a separate strategy for DEI, but it has to be as part of the core strategy. And that's something that I would challenge each one of us to think about moving forward. Let's give a huge round of applause to this amazing panel. To Deb, to Tom, to Anne and to Angela. They're even giving themselves a round of applause. Every single day, all four of you do so much to contribute to downtown, to make it a more inclusive place, to a thriving place economically, a better transportation system, and a better quality of life for everyone in our city. And as the mayor said, when downtown is strong, the rest of the city is strong. So thank you so much for being on this panel. We cannot thank you enough. Now, I do want to dovetail, make one announcement on something that Angela talked about. If you want to learn more about the built environment and design justice, please attend our annual dinner on Monday, October 28th, 5 p.m. at Monona Terrace, where we have architect and head of um, co-locate in New Orleans, Brian C. Lee, talking about design justice in the built environment. It will be an incredible conversation and one that this city needs to hear. So please do not miss that again. Monday, October 28th, 5 p.m. at the Monona Terrace. We want to thank a couple of people for what they've done here today. First and foremost, Katie Hinkle and Michael Best for your continued partnership of this important event. Without this report, we would not know how we're doing in the city of Madison and downtown and how we can move forward. So thank you, Katie and Michael Best. But also a huge thank you to Sandra for the wonderful space we have here at the Overture Center. Night in and night out, you do you make this downtown alive. And you're even bringing Hamilton, which is fantastic for everybody, right? Uh, she says she has free tickets at the front of the room, so everyone rush up here and say hi. That was a joke, that was a joke. <laughs> Lastly, I wanna thank every single person that's in this room. You all are working every single day to make downtown a better place for everyone. Let's continue, we've only just begun on this work, but I wanna thank you for what you've done so far. Know that DMI is gonna work directly with the city to continue to make downtown better for everyone. Enjoy your weekend and thank you very much.